Hello, happy Thursday. How's it going? Um, I hope you're having an amazing day. I hope you're settling in for a great evening with your sketchbook or your drawing. Or sorry, I'm looking over to the left because I'm making sure that I can see myself. And so far, I'm not popping up yet on that screen. I'm popping up over here. Okay, now I see myself. So sorry about that. I always have to make sure I actually am live and not just talking to myself in my studio, which, you know, could be fun too, but this is better. Um, anyways, so I hope you're ready for an hour's worth of some really cool sketching time. I have beautiful reference pictures ready for you today and we'll be focusing on eyes. Um, if you're catching this for the very first time, like you're catching the recording or you're here live with me right now for the very first time, let me give you the rundown of how this works and how you can get the most out of this one hour. Um, first of all, I'm Carolyn Peters. Uh, I'm the owner of Cura Studios and that's where I teach traditional drawing skills to artists who want to have like a really solid footing to explore their creative voice from. And with that, I offer weekly live sketch sessions like this, and um, it's a combination where I give you a lesson up front, a brief three to five point lesson, and then we all dive in together um, and implement what I offer up because so much of um, learning that's on happening online seems to be pretty passive. And when we learn passively, like when we just absorb what's being said and we're just listening, only 5% of that sticks. So the way I design these sessions is that you draw along with me in real time and we're both kind of muddling through, you know, um, kind of you get a sense that, you know, even people who've been drawing for a long time, they have shitty drawings and they have good drawings and it hopefully normalizes the, the, the practice part. And um, um, usually I rotate subject matters and I rotate the lessons. So today we're on portraits. Last week it was figure, next week it will be animals, and then the last category is inanimate things. And as I said, the lessons they always um, change. And you are in charge of picking how intense you're gonna have your lesson tonight. You can um, put me on mute and just enjoy the reference images and just play, or you can um, work really hard and try exactly what I'm doing, or you can find your sweet spot in between. It's your time and you make it work for you. All right, with that, um, as I said, we're gonna be talking about eyes today, but I just wanna say right away, we're not gonna draw eyes individually as in like removed from the context of the head, but the lesson is going to be how do we place eyes well in context of the entirety of the head? That's gonna be what I'll be focusing my commentary on and um, what I'll be demonstrating as well. I have four reference images ready for you and the first one is 10 minutes, then we have two 15 minutes, and the last one is a 20 minute. And what I recommend is once you've done the session once and you liked one pose in particular, find the recording, pause an image and redraw it again for however long you want to. All right, with that, I'm gonna switch cameras. Hey, Ted, good to see you. Um, and show you what I've prepared. So I have three main points I want to bring up. Light a little bit further down. Okay, so point number one I wanna talk about. Oh, hey, Chris, good to see you. Um, virtually. The first thing I want to talk about is um, where the eyes fit in context to the entire head. And then I want to talk about the structure that the eyes are sitting in, which is called the eye socket. And then we're going to talk about the parts and the ones that many of us um, often don't even think about. Hey, Francis, good to see you too. Um, all right. Let's talk about proportions. So what do you wanna be aware of? That if you have a straight on view of the head from top to chin, if you cut that in half, that is exactly the halfway point of the eye. So that means where the tear duct is. Now, of course, this is only useful if your head or your model's head is actually upright. 
So meaning their, t their chin isn't tucked and their nose isn't pointing up in the air. It's a level head. That's when being aware of this halfway point measurement is useful. Uh, another measurement you can use is beginning at the hairline. So not the top, but the hairline. Go to the brow and that should be a third of this entire distance from hairline to chin. So you can have hairline to brow being a third, brow to the bottom of the nose being a third, and then the base of the nose to the chin being a third. So again, that only works if you have a level head position. Now, the important thing is that we get away from thinking about the eyes as something like this this almond shaped thing that has a pupil that's kind of lasery, that has individual lashes. Like this is kind of a symbolic um, thing we have memorized in our brains. And what we want to move toward is this idea that no, 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 no. These are balls, orbs that are um, resting inside of this shelf like structure called the eye socket. So that's what I have figured out for you guys over here. So if you take the, the eye socket um, out of context of the head, it's basically like this arc-like visor thing that has a bottom shelf and you have these two gelatinous orbs in there. And this structure is protecting the orbs from getting damaged. That's the whole purpose of this. And it's receding into the skull. So it's kind of sitting tucked back in there. Um, and these orbs are pretty, pretty dang big. So um, something to consider because we'll later on stretch lids over these eyeballs. Now, when you see the eye socket up front, like frontal, um, notice this is parallel. Well, not parallel, excuse me, it's um, symmetrical. That's what I'm looking for. So this side is equal to the side. But often we see our models at a three quarter position. So that's when a little bit of understanding of perspective comes in handy. So this arc that was symmetrical is now gonna be an arc that's in perspective, meaning whatever is closer to us is bigger and whatever is further away from us becomes slightly smaller. So this orb will be bigger, this orb will be smaller, and this arc here has now a slightly different shape from the stereotypical frontal arc. And then the last thing, of course, if we have a profile, that arc, we only see half of it, and it has a completely different shape now. So learning to recognize these shapes of the eye socket is a great starting point. And how can you practice that? Master copies is great or doing little overlays of these on magazine photographs of models. That's what I would practice. Okay, last point before we dive into the images. Let's get clear on which individual parts of the eye we need to account for in our drawings. So Let's begin with the thing that we think about as the eye. Like this is usually the part we think about as the eye, the open part. Make sure you have a tear duct, which is separate from your lids. Sometimes they fuse together, but you at least want to think about it as a separate entity. Remember, this one is at the halfway point of the head. For the top lid, it's useful to seek out if you can identify one, two, three major angles, a longer one here in the center, a short horizontal one atop, and then a really steep short one at the outside. For the lower lid, thinking about it as two main angles is useful. Now, of course, not everybody is like that, but it's a good starting point. You know, this is like the norm, and then we can vary from this norm. It results now in one, two, three planes for the top lid, and one, two planes for the lower lid. And now check this out. If you're really close to your model, you'll notice that this lid isn't just a line drawn on their head. It's actually a structure that has thickness. 
So you, if you can, and if the lighting is good on your model, you want to reflect the fact that there is a thickness to their lid, especially if you're drawing your eye really big. So here comes the thing that people usually don't think about. This part, I call it the underbrow. It's basically just the edge of the brow bone that's underneath the eyebrow. So right, we usually think about, oh, and the iris and the pupil, and surely it's the lashes that makes the person look like the person and the hair on the eyebrow. But no, in fact, it's the shapes being created by the underbrow that crease being created in between the underbrow and the top of the lid. So I'll say it again because that's the important part. So you know how we talked about the upper lid and having like three major planes. We have this wrinkle here. That's where the lid recedes into the eye socket. And how much of the lid is being exposed here varies from person to person. This distance will make your drawing look like the person you're drawing in combination with the shape above it slash below the brow. So seeking out this underbrow shape in context to this exposed lid shape is gonna hugely improve your drawings. And the last thing, remember the eye does not, like if this is your head shape, don't just draw your eyes like this, like bringing the corners of it to the edge of your head. There is a distance in between the, the edge of the skull and your eye. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> Let's dive in to our actual drawings. You can see I have this beautiful model um, and she's all dolled up as a queen because this is from a painting series I did. So I'm gonna start the video on this. As I said, we have 10 minutes on the first one and then they grow longer. And as I said, I'll be working in um, like the, the entire head, focusing on the eye structure, but you get to do whatever you want. And if questions come up as we draw, just put them in the chat. I like hearing from you. I do understand too that um, you have pencils in your hands. So sometimes it's hard to stop and chat. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm building my um, cranium sphere and I'm putting a little shape for the facial mask in there and now put this rubber band around where I think the halfway point is and I double check by aligning the tip of my pencil with the top edge of my shape, my fingers with where I have the rubber band and I see if the bottom half is equal. It's not quite equal so I'm gonna shift it up just a little bit because this is a head-on position, right? So she's not tucking her chin or lifting her chin up. So. Um, that's why I'm making sure that I have my halfway point accounted for. The next thing I'll pay attention to is that the center line is truly in the center. How can you check that? You look at the ears. I'm seeing more of this ear and I'm barely seeing the other ear. So I know that this cannot possibly be in the true center of my shape. So it has to be shifted over a little bit. And now my next step is bringing in the shape of the eye socket. Finding the corner of the eyebrow. So these landmarks, I talk about them or, ha or I have talked about them a lot in the previous sketch sessions where we focused on the entire structure of the head. So if you're not, not familiar with the word temporal ridge, um, go back and find those videos. Okay, so it doesn't look anything like the model on the screen, but that's um, because I'm working on my underdrawing first. Often we don't see um, the underdrawing in the finished beautiful results of the masters, but that's the thinking underneath it. Okay, so now I'm going to place my orbs 
and it's, that that face always looks funny so I'm, I'm placing them very lightly and I want to make sure that whatever like this is the side that's closer to me this is the side that's farther away from me so whatever's closer to me because of the laws of perspective has to be bigger this has to be slightly smaller not a ton but it definitely shouldn't be reversed and so now that I have this, I begin building um, my eyes. I usually like to put in the, the nasal structure, the top at least, the glabella. So I'm going to work on that just for a little while. Especially because if I draw in the glabella, it helps me determine how deep the eye socket is. And since I'm focusing on eyes, that's important. So if you see this little box that I'm drawing here, this box at the root of the nose, it has three planes. The ones with the stars are the ones that tell me how deep it goes into the eye socket. And that is different person to person. Some people have really deep eye sockets and others have pretty shallow eye sockets. Okay, so the other reason why having this step down into your eye socket is useful because then you can tell, did I place my orb too close to the center? So like if you're wondering, well, how the hell do I know how big to make my my jelly orbs, um, there should be, at least from a almost frontal position, one eye's width in between. So full frontal, you should be able to have one of these balls fit in between. But I see what I'm not doing is I'm not like making a big fat orb line um, or circle line. I, I am just kind of ghosting it in. And now I know, okay, now I know where to place my, um, what's it called, tear duct. And now I'm seeking out those angles I talked about. I'm actually getting to the more stereotypical eye portion. And I'm seeking out those angles. And once I have one element, I immediately go to the other side. So this is a little trick if you have trouble or if you're usually running into trouble with like things being offset from each other, because then I can carry it over to the other side. And I can make sure that the top rim of this lid aligns with the top rim of the other lid. Um, do I have my eraser? So when you draw and you're practicing, I don't recommend you erase to get rid of, um, uh, nah, how to say this differently. So what I'm trying to say is I will erase as I draw if my underdrawing lines are starting to be, be in the way but I don't like the idea of erasing to kind of hide mistakes I've been making or like to hide my thinking lines, if that makes any sense. Because I think, especially as beginners, we get caught up in erasing, 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 and so that we never have any forward momentum. Okay, so right now I'm working on those creases, those lid creases where the lid recedes into the eye socket. I'm paying attention to how far away from the rim of the lid are they? And again, I draw one side and then I draw the other side. It helps me keep track if I'm still having the eye that's further away from me be slightly smaller. I'm noticing mine is a little bit too big, so let's shrink that down. Let's bring that in. And so now I'm getting to the underbrow shape. So the brow itself is really easy to, to draw just because, you know, 
they're recognizable, we have a, a name for it, but this underbrow shade, we don't even have a name that we use on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. And so, the way I think about it is, if I had to cut this out of construction paper and I then held that shape up, what, what would it look like? In my drawing, if I cut that underbrow shape out at this point, would it look similar or would it look really, really different? Okay, so last thing, hopefully I still have time for it, um, that I forgot to mention is this underlid. So right, we, we have the top part of the lid that, that's exposed, but we also have this, this bottom outside of the lower lid. And I'm just gonna draw these little facets here. So that's yet another shape to become aware of. And so that's, again, the bottom protection of, of your orb before we get into the cheekbone. And then the last part I'll add, if even, if I'm focusing on just practicing my structure, um, but of course, if it's a true portrait that somebody's gonna put on the wall, of course I'm gonna put those things in, but the last thing I'm putting in are the actual shapes of the iris. And I'm paying close attention to how big is that, how much of it is exposed, um, what are the white shapes around it like? And we talked about this in a previous sketch session. It's called the white of the eye, but I think we came up with a much better one um, because it's not truly white because most of the times eyes are in shadow. Then we come up with something along the lines of the yolk of the eye. Something like that. Let's see that that eye socket is all in shadow. Okay, let's move to the next one. Grab a different pencil. All right. So slightly different head position. So that means that um, our placement will be different and um, the eye socket perspective will look different. So my beginning shape of the head is always just like this guitar pick like thing. I'm thinking about the cranium. Once I have that, I'm looking for the center line. This imaginary line running down the center of the face. And I'm quickly also looking for the temporal ridge. That gives me a sense for where the forehead ends and my side plane begins. Now I'm just doing my best, you know, I, I don't always know in the beginning where exactly to place it. I, I make make a guess and then I kind of lean back and ask myself if that feels good. Okay, so we're kind of looking up at her, so I'm wondering if the halfway point will even work. So I'm gonna lean inside the camera real quick to measure on my screen, so excuse my shoulder. Yeah, so the bottom portion is slightly bigger than the top portion because we're looking up at her. So I'm making my bottom portion slightly bigger than the top portion. Not a ton, just a little bit.
halfway point is where the um, tear duct is. The brows are above that. For the brow, remember you use the, the hairline. So hairline to brow, that's a third. And then brow to nose, that's about a third. Let's bring this up a little bit. Okay, so now roughly my proportions, and now I'm getting into the, the shape of the eye socket. So you can see this beautifully on her. Can you tell how the contour here on the left, it kind of creates this inward um, pinch like that. Uh, it's, it's, I think, um, is it Steve Houston? He describes it as like the way a whistle notch looks. I find that a useful visual. And then you have the same thing happening on the other side. See how this, it's basically the shelf receding into the skull here and then jutting back out, like the, the cheekbone jutting back out. And because this is our closer side, this is the larger structure, we have more real estate here and slightly less real estate there. So now I have the perspective of my eye socket, and now I can think about that glabella. Um, I do believe, oh yeah, I, I remember, we, we did do a um, stream together on noses. So for those of you who are catching this for the first time and you're curious about learning more about nose structure and what, what is this glabella thing you keep talking about, um, definitely check out that one. So again, because we need to find out how deep this goes, how deep is this person's eye socket. And so now, now because I have this line now, I know where I can begin with my orb. And just how I'm carrying over, or how I was carrying over earlier, I'm carrying over here right now as well, making sure they're kind of aligning. Okay, so now I can see, and I want to make sure that my tear duct doesn't sit inside of my nose box. I want to make sure that the nose box ends and then my tear duct begins. So now, of course, her eyes are closed, so the lid rim is almost flat. Now I'm paying attention to the exposed shape of the lid. You can even get a sense for, oh, and this is where the roundness of the eyeball ends and the underside of the brow bone begins. Isn't that so cool? Okay. And then lastly, of course, I need the height of the lower lid. So this is all just the linear structure. Like it doesn't look like much. Like it's not something I would walk around proudly with and say, hey, look at my beautiful drawing. It's just me practicing seeing and recording the structure well. And then if I have those longer poses to work from and I could put all that fancy shading on top, I can structure my shading in a way to reinforce that beautiful 3D indication, that linear 3D indication. So speaking of which, I'm gonna begin with that now on the right side. So we have the light coming from this angle puts this entire right side into shadow. And 
the shadow ends here and kind of curls into that lid crease a little bit. And then this, because, see, the light's coming from here, the nose is blocking the light. And so it's creating a cast shadow. And cast shadows fall over the roundness of whatever form, or they, they take on the roundness of whatever form they take uh, fall over. So the eyeball is round, so this cast shadow is rounded. So use cast shadows to help you imply the underlying form. Might as well, rather than canceling out your attempts at building form. So now here, we roll into a form shadow. And yes, there is a video where I talk about the difference between form shadows and cast shadows and um, whatever it is that I'm doing right now. It's either called light logic or shadow mapping. I can't remember how I titled it. So notice how things like brows and lashes, they often get swallowed up by the light logic, like um, they get to become almost like a part of the shadow mass. And so it's more important to record your shadow patterns well than it is to draw your individual lashes and stuff like that. Some of these construction lines here. So I'm putting some shading on this brow socket area because it's angling away from the light. The forehead is definitely angling more at the light. So even though in the photos, like if we look without kind of asking ourselves questions like that, we might assume, oh, they're just the same, they both have light. But um, in fact, 
this plane is angling away. So therefore it's slightly darker. Not, it's not a shadow, but it's slightly darker. we need that thickness, the brow bone in between the eyeball here and the edge of the face. You can use the eyes to align other features with. Um, most um, useful is it, it is for the edge of the wing of the nose. So usually the, the wing of the nose will align with your tear duct. And then you can look how the corner of the mouth aligns upward with the rest of the eye. another 15 minute pose. So now you know how long 15 minutes are, how far along you get with your drawing, what you can focus on. And um, I usually say this every session because it's useful as a reminder. I, I don't look at these sketch sessions as a time to produce finished drawings. It's a time to, to practice. So we get better by repetition, by doing things many times over and over. And so that's why I give you multiple short poses rather than just one long one. Um, we definitely may do one long one in the future, but for now, let's do these shorter ones. And as I said earlier, like you can always come back and pause at your favorite pose and give yourself as much time as you want. So I was measuring what, where's the halfway point, because remember I used the halfway point to help me place my tear ducts. This seems a pretty straightforward head position, so I don't think there's any foreshortening happening. place my center line mindfully. I, I'm aware that I see more of my left side because that's where I see a lot, a lot of the ear. The ear is even sticking out beyond the head shape here. Barely see anything on the other side for the ear. And then I'm seeking out where's my temporal ridge. So I have a very shallow side plane here. Side plane gives me the starting point of the eye socket. Remember the top of the eye socket is where the brows are. So the brows are above the halfway point. You can check if you have the top of your eye socket accurately by going back to thinking about your thirds. Hairline the brow, 
brow to the base of the nose, base of the nose to the chin, those should be equal thirds. On a level head, that is. Here is that incision into the cranium, then the cheekbone comes out. And you know, obviously those cheekbones are rounded, so there's not this hard corner that I'm drawing. But you know, if you had to make a call, if you had to make a decision where the top of the cheekbone ends and the side of the cheekbone begins, where would you draw that line? So as I said, um, a great way to practice this is by looking at photographs either on a magazine or just, you know, um, old photographs you have lying around, put some tracing paper over it, and then you just, rather than, you know, drawing the, the stereotypical parts of the eye, you, you seek out where is the eye socket in this, on this person. Okay, working on my glabella, the root of the nose, just to establish the depth of this eye socket. And it's so interesting to see the variation between people. I truly believe that um, by drawing, and especially by drawing in a trained way, like where you where you kind of aren't just kind of aimlessly, intuitively drawing, but if you're like understanding how to break things into shapes, how to break things into simple three D structure, like if if you train yourself to do that you gain this ability to see life in a whole new way. Um, like, like it's almost like it unfolds a new experience of life. And that's why I love art so much. Because, you know, I mean, nothing wrong with going through life without artist's eyes. Well, for me, actually, there's a lot wrong with that. But um, I, I really enjoy just being able to appreciate, oh my God, the shape of your underbrow is just gorgeous, you know, and and just getting to enjoy that part. Um, it's just like a like you get a little present every time you draw a little appreciation for these things that surround us every day and are easily overlooked. I know, total nerd alert. <laughs> Okay, so as I'm placing the next eye, I'm looking how far away is it from the nose. I'm trying to make sure it's aligned with the other one here. It's like my nose isn't quite right. Let's scoot that over. And so again, I'm tra not tracing, but I'm carrying over. Okay, here's where the tear duct is. Let's connect them. Here's the top rim. Let's connect them. And you gotta make sure that the the from eye corner to tear duct to the other eyes tear duct to the other eyes corner that that's all sitting on one straight line, and that straight line is wait for it perpendicular to the central axis. <laughs> so if you're like, what the heck's a central axis? Um, seek out the structure video. Trust me. You'll learn so much. I even had props. I even brought a hard boiled egg. 
again, I'm carrying over the lower lid to the other side. Okay, so see this eye is bigger, this eye is smaller. Let me scoot this over. And now that I have the stereotypical part of the eye, I'm gonna take this out. I'm gonna pay attention to okay, how much of the lid is exposed. Very little. It's a very short distance on her. She has a really um, large brow bone. So now I'm looking at the angle and shape of the brow, the actual eyebrow, not just the, the structural part. I can take this line out. Okay, and before I move to the other side, I'm gonna pay attention to the lower lid, the outside of the lower lid. And I'm drawing this slightly because those lines aren't necessarily meant to stay later on in my drawing. They'll help me um, understand where I need to place my mid-tones. So if you're catching this recording, or even for you guys who are here live, um, let me know if you like the idea of doing like a full one hour rendition of one of these poses or one of the other portraits we've been working on. If this is something you'd be interested in. Or if you prefer the shorter ones. If you have any requests, let me know. I'm happy to facilitate. This is your time as much as it's mine. You see, so now I need to widen out my, my eye socket bone here. I have gotten too narrow. So when you look at a portrait like this, rather than kind of, because we all talk to ourselves when we draw, right? And it's really important that we become aware of how we talk to ourselves when we draw because it can be useful or it can be um, detrimental. So when I talk to myself and I draw, I'm thinking, okay, this shape here of the upper lid, how does that go? So it's wider here and then it becomes a narrow sliver. And then at that third angle, it's like really thin. Did I catch that? Okay. So instead of, because like the more typical way that people talk to this themselves when they draw is like, oh, this sucks. This doesn't look anything like her. Like, why do I suck at drawing eyes? <laughs> Does any of that sound familiar? Maybe. So we want to switch away from these kind of judgmental thoughts, which are, you know, they're not helpful um, to these more observant, descriptive thoughts. And what I was just telling my class this morning is, that like you, you want to get in the habit of abstracting what you're looking at, not to diminish its beauty, but so you can actually represent its beauty more successfully. Because if we keep saying, oh, this eye, it's so beautiful, and this eye, and you have like all these associations about what eyes are like for you, um, that'll keep you from seeing it in artist terms. It'll keep you from seeing what kind of shape it truly is because you have assumptions about it you have expectations around it and so instead learning to abstract it and seeing okay what kind of angle is this what kind of shape is this, this is a triangular shape or a um, oval shape and what kind of oval is it and then let's let's add some value language like is this a dark shape or a light shape let's compare it to what's around it so you see this it's it's descriptive it's talking about the formal 
elements of drawing rather than, you know, the stories we have connected to what we're drawing. Right now I'm recording shadow patterns. And so rather than me jumping right into eyelashes and irises and reflections on the eye, um, I, I spent my time working on the structure because that will help me understand how to light that thing. And you can tell when, when people, and, and this is not to knock anybody's attempts because I, I started there too, but you can tell when, when somebody's just kind of copying um, exactly what they see from a photograph and, and they might capture most of it beautifully. Uh, but, but you can tell like this is, there's something, it's not quite as accomplished as some of these other drawings. Like what do these classically trained artists have that I don't, that, that's what I used to think, you know? It's like, I know my drawing is good, I have the likeness, and I know my shading is pretty sensitive, but like there's something missing. And so what I learned while I got my training is that like that structural understanding was missing. And representing something three-dimensionally just with line. It's not as sexy, but it's definitely Super helpful. Alrighty, last pose. We have 15 minutes for this one. I love that picture. It's a little bit dark from on my screen, so I hope I can even see the closer eye. I'll do my best. Before you get too far along, notice how there's just a little bit of a slant to her head. So that's what I mean by seeing the head in an abstracted term. So if you just kind of squint your eyes, you just see the shape of it, notice that this kind of guitar pick-like shape, it's not perfectly upright. I mean, really close to perfectly upright, but there's just a hint of a slant to it. Cranium, facial mask. Okay, so now I'm finding center lines. I'm seeing the right ear more, don't see the left ear. So we have yet another kind of three quarter position. I'm gonna guesstimate that my center line is here. And I'm looking for the temporal ridge. So temporal ridge is where the peak of the eyebrow is, the high point of the eyebrow. That's where your side plane begins. Now notice, um, right now, this is a smaller distance than what I have on the left. And that can't be, because this is my closer side, like the side of the head is closer to me. So I'm gonna scoot my center line over and then back to a feasible perspective. There we go. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Halfway point, but we're looking up at her, so I'm guessing that the lower half of the head is going to appear slightly larger than the upper half of the head. I 
Make sure that as you're snapping that rubber band for the center line, um, that it's perpendicular to your head's axis. Otherwise you get this droopy eye situation. So this upper line here on my brow, my brows, I guess, and then this lower line here is where the tear ducts will be, and this will need to come even lower. I'm just, I'm just guesstimating that. I'm just giving myself a starting point. This might have to change. Okay, good enough for now, move on. Um, seeking out how the eye socket recedes into the side plane here. Finding its counterpart on the other side. And again, there's not really a line there, you know, so you just have to do your best. Like if you had to make a choice, where does the the, the temple bone end and the underbrow begin. So that's the line I'm drawing here. So if you're drawing along, you're thinking, hmm, all this talk about structure and um, classical training. That sounds good or like oh I used to have some of that and I don't anymore or uh, like oh I could use a refresher or I, I would like to learn for the very first time we definitely want to get on my mailing list um, for the next year I'm planning on doing a classical drawing workshop where you can freshen up those really crucial drawing skills so if you're on my mailing list you'll be the first one to know be the first one to get a special price on it. So if you're not on my email list yet, you can find the link to get on it in the description below the video. Okay. I have my eye socket bigger, closer to me, smaller, further away from me. Now I'm going to build the glabella briefly. I'm stepping into the eye socket, into the eye socket. And this is here the under, the under inside plane. I need to make names for all these things. <laughs> So now that I have that, I can place my orbs and go to town with actually drawing the eye shapes. So you might think to yourself, oh my gosh, like so much preparatory work just to draw a simple eye. I'm not sure if I'm into that idea but that is truly what separates professionals from, from um, amateurs who didn't get any training. It's like, if we don't have training, we draw what we see. If we do have training, we draw what we understand about the underlying structure and translate. We don't just copy, we translate. 
once you're there, you get so much freedom because then you can draw from imagination eventually. Make things up. Keep drawing when the model moves on, etc. Okay, so tear duct. So remember, I've got to place my tear duct only once in the nose box finishes up. I'm doing my best here. This is very dark on my screen, so I can barely see. It's because I have these studio lights shining at me. So like when I look at this on, on my desk, it looked really good. And now that I have these studio lights glaring at me, I'm not seeing it as well anymore. I hope it's better on your end. So this is something to um, make bigger. Since we're looking up at her, if this is our eye, um, the, the orb of the eye, and you have the top rim of the lid, the lower lid rim is doing something like this. Now, if this was a um, position where we're kind of at the same eye level as her, that lower lid would arc down. See that? So I'm going to, I don't have some color, but like, so that lower lid, this is arcing down if we're at eye level with the person, but if we're looking up at them, this is arcing up and we're seeing the thickness of this lid really well, or at least we're supposed to, if it's not all hidden in shadow. Looking at the underbrow shape, finding the actual eyebrow. Okay, and I didn't practice what I preached earlier. I kind of drew this whole eye in isolation, and now I need to carry over what I did over here. I usually like to do just the shape first, and then carry over the shape, then do the lid, then do the lid. It's kind of going working both eyes at the same time. But I was talking, <laughs> so I forgot. <laughs> That's how I usually do it. It's the same thing here. This is angling. Up. So you have that tear duct that goes up and then over. I'm going to make sure that this is smaller than this. Again, that exposed part of the lid is very small on her. We definitely need that brow bone, or eye socket thickness. And then here's the actual brow. Temple goes up and forehead over. Okay, so now that I have this, I can start putting in the actual iris shapes. Notice how dark, so yes, we call it the white of the eye, but notice how dark the white of the eye is. And again, the reason is because it's in the eye socket, in the recesses of the eye socket. Um, not a lot of direct sunlight hitting it. Okay, 
with whatever time I have left. I feel like I was dilly-dallying on this one. With whatever time I have left, I'm gonna record some shadows on here. So towards the end of the sketch sessions, I get usually pretty quiet because I start to sink into my drawing brain. And you might know this, like the parts of our brains that process um, visual information um, is, is different from the parts that process verbal information. So the more I draw, the more my talking brain starts to want to relax and <laughs> not have to work. Which makes for better drawings. So um, you might notice if you're ever um, drawing in company and you're chatting a lot, you're drawing may not be as good as the drawings you do in your own time. It's because there's a conflict happening in your brain. So again, you can use the tear duct to align the wings of the nose to So here's something else to consider, something I haven't said yet, uh, that a typical mistake that we make when we draw eyes is that we make them much too big for the context of the head. And that's a psychological thing it's because eyes are so important to us psychologically because that's how we connect with people, that's how we read people. Um, and so they have this huge importance to us. And so 
Um, we often unknowingly make them way too big in our drawing. And so, you know, you get all these bug-eyed drawings. I definitely have my fair share of those and I still have them. Um, and I know that my students often do this too when they first learn to draw portraits. And, and this is nothing to beat yourself up, self up over. It's just, just um, you know, it's understandable. But um, again, once we, we know those things, once we know these tendencies, we can counter them if we so choose. Or we can play them up and stylize them and have fun with it that way. So now as I'm assigning some values to this, I'm definitely thinking about the planes, like which plane is angling the most away from the light and which ones are slightly angled at it but still in the shadow. But that is a lesson for another time, I suppose. So um, let me switch them over. Oop, where's my mouse? There it is. All right, well, there you have it. That was... Um, an hour's worth of looking just at eyes and trying to place them uh, in right relationship to the rest of the head. I hope you learned some good tips. Um, let's go over it one last time really briefly. First, you want to make sure you have your eyes placed in the right position. So you want to remember that at the halfway point from top to bottom, halfway point is where the tear ducts are. And um, in terms of the eye socket, you want to go off of the hairline, not the top. And then you want to divide this here in thirds and you have hairline to brow, that's a third. Brow to bottom of the nose is a third. Bottom of the nose to the chin is a third. So that's the first thing. So of course, if the head is tilting back, you, you don't want to think of it as like a perfect line, but as a rubber band that snaps around an egg. Once you have that kind of guesstimation of, of where your halfway point is, you want to locate your eye socket, that structure, that shelf that kind of cuts into the, the brain, not brain, the, the cranium um, that's keeping your eyeballs safe. And you want to look for the corner of the eyebrow for that. And um, you want to think of it as like this visor shape that will foreshorten, as in like it will visually distort if you're not seeing it straight on. So practice recognizing those shapes in different um, head positions. And lastly, you want to get familiar and remember all those parts that we usually don't talk about. You know, yes, we talk about lashes and we talk about eyeballs, but we usually don't talk about this underlid. We don't talk about the tear duct very often. We don't talk about the underbrow. We don't talk about the little crease in between the lid and the underbrow. So remembering those um, little forgotten pieces um, and putting them into your drawing will make them so much better. So I hope you had a great time. I would love to see if you came up with anything that you're happy to share. If so, you can tag me at, in Instagram or on Instagram at Kira Studios. I'd love to give you a virtual high five and cheer you on. And um, yeah, as I said, get on my email newsletter and um, I'll talk to you like your best friends and you get weekly tips and you'll never miss one of these sketch sessions again. All right. Well, hope you're having a great evening. I'll see you soon.